A mom ate five-day-old sushi for dinner. This is how her brain shut down. JC is a 34-year-old woman presenting to the emergency room with insomnia, sensory deficits, and psychosis. Her husband, Jonathan, tells the admitting nurse that she had a psychotic episode the night before, bent over and curled up on the floor before suffering urinary and fecal incontinence. She hadn't slept for at least the last three days. About nine months ago, JC had some trouble. She got home late from work. She didn't have any food in her fridge and everything was closed. She found some sushi in her fridge that she bought from a gas station a few days ago. She wasn't sure if it would be okay, but she hadn't eaten all day and she knew she wouldn't be able to sleep that night if she didn't have anything to eat. Immediately after eating the five-day-old gas station sushi, JC felt good. It slid down smoothly and she didn't really even need to chew it. Five-day-old leftovers were always a little sketchy in her mind, especially if it was from the gas station. And the fish did taste a little sour, but just put some more soy sauce on it to mask it out, she thought. This five-day-old gas station sushi was so uneventful, she didn't even remember eating it. As the days passed, life was normal for JC, but about five months ago, and four months after that night, JC started having insomnia. She would go to bed at 11 p.m., but would toss and turn. She'd close her eyes, but nothing would happen, and she could watch as the sun would rise at 7 a.m. The day following her sleepless night would be filled with anxiety and confusion. She would feel like her heart was beating in her neck. She dreaded nighttime knowing she could end up watching the sun rise again the next morning. It was around this time that JC would periodically feel her stomach cramp. It would come and go and she could feel it jiggle and shake. Sometimes it'd be followed by the loosest and most watery stool she's ever had in her life. She told her husband that it felt like a fish was flapping around in her belly. JC wasn't sure if she was just too stressed or whatever was going on with her sleep. She tried melatonin, she tried essential oils and special teas. Some nights she'd sleep okay, but there was no consistency. Nothing made any sense. JC started seeing little bugs crawl around on the walls. She couldn't see them directly in her field of view, but they would hang around on the sides of her eyes. She could see little creatures creep and crawl around. She was so exhausted from her insomnia that she wasn't sure if it was because of the sleep deprivation. But as the days passed, those bugs on the wall started crawling underneath her skin. One night, while JC was wide awake, she couldn't feel her hands and feet, and as she got up from bed, she felt that her pants were wet as a warm fluid started rolling down her leg, becoming colder the further it dripped down. She realized it was urine, but she had no idea how she let that happen. In the urgent care clinic seven months after eating the five-day-old sushi, JC did appear to be healthy. Just looking at her, doctors couldn't find any immediate problems. Her diet was okay, maybe a little aggressive in the calorie deficit, but she exercised regularly. Her blood tests all returned normal. The urgent care doctor didn't really want to tell her that it was all in her head. You know what? Maybe you're just stressed and maybe we can give you some magnesium to help you sleep, he said. Stress causes insomnia, it causes urinary incontinence. JC's young, she's healthy, she's not pregnant. Medicines might cause additional side effects, so the doctor was convinced. Cognitive behavioral therapy was the best solution here. JC could maybe sleep one night a week still, so there was still some hope. And nobody ever mentioned anything about some days old sushi that JC ate for dinner one night because JC herself didn't even remember she had eaten it. As she expected, the cognitive behavioral therapy did absolutely nothing for her insomnia. One night, her husband saw her mumbling to herself in the corner. She was shaking and her pants were wet. As she passes out and starts having a seizure, Jonathan calls for 911 and she's brought to the emergency room where we are now. At examination, doctors weren't entirely sure what was happening, but looking at her blood underneath a microscope, doctors find that JC had macrocytosis. Macro meaning large, cyto meaning cell, but in this case referring to red blood cell, and osis denoting an abnormal state, abnormally large red blood cells. But not only were they large, she overall had less red blood cells than normal, something known as anemia. An meaning without, and emia meaning presence of blood. Without enough red blood cells to carry oxygen to her organs, this could explain why she was so exhausted over the last several months. But if those blood cells are bigger than normal, then maybe they could hold more oxygen than normal, so it should all even out, right? Doctors find that JC's red blood cells aren't just larger than normal, they never fully matured. 
Some of her white blood cells were also malformed. Something was wrong with their nucleus. And because the nucleus is where the DNA and genetic material is, this means that JC has a problem that would cause her blood cells to be immature, but something's wrong. Anemia by itself usually can't cause neurologic problems. JC doesn't just have insomnia, she can't control her bladder. She has hallucinations and delusions, and an exam finds that she has sensory ataxia. A meaning without, and taxia meaning order. Sensory meaning her awareness of the position and movement of her body. This was combined with impaired reflexes, all of this pointing to some potential neurodegeneration on JC's part. If her blood cells aren't properly formed because something's wrong with her ability to make DNA, then something similar could be happening to her nerve cells too, meaning the anemia and neurodegeneration are happening because of the same problem. And when cells aren't maturing properly, this could be because of a nutritional deficiency. Doctors note that JC was slender, she had indents in her cheeks, which could mean potential malnourishment, and she was less than 70% of her calculated ideal body weight, a clinical measure based on height. Her husband confirms that over the last several months, she decreased her daily intake from two meals down to just breakfast in the morning that would sometimes only be a cup of coffee. Even after she started dieting for several months, she simply just ate less every day. In the step-down unit, doctors looked closer at another blood test. Most nutrient levels were normal, but her vitamin B12 level was low, telling doctors exactly what they need to know. Vitamin B12 is a nutrient needed by humans. Our bodies don't make it, so we need to source it from our diet. And its impact in the body is indirect. DNA is made inside cells so that genetic material can be passed down when cells reproduce. Vitamin B12 is important in creating DNA backbone. So when there isn't enough of B12, proper DNA isn't made. Red blood cells in the body live for about 120 days before they're broken down and new ones are made. Every day when you have a stomach movement, the fecal matter is brown as a result of red blood cell breakdown. And in JC's case, if the proper DNA isn't created, then her new blood cells don't form properly explaining her macrocytosis. In the mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, vitamin B12 promotes ATP production, which cells use for energy. If B12 isn't present, energy production is disrupted, but even worse, different chemicals start building up. The nerves need lots of energy to function, so they use a lot of ATP. Buildup of these different chemicals start forming in the fatty myelin sheath, which helps transmit electrical signals all throughout the nervous system. As these chemicals accumulate and build up because vitamin B12 isn't there to make the right chemicals, they start eating away at the myelin, degrading it, causing neurodegeneration. She can't sleep because of the nerve damage. She's delusional, psychotic, and hallucinating because of the nerve damage. Doctors give JC vitamin B12 injections to kickstart her recovery. As the days go by, JC starts to recover and become herself again. She's able to sleep well for the first time in several months. Doctors recommend she take supplemental vitamin B12 by mouth and move off her restrictive diet as they discharge her from the hospital. Over the next several weeks, things seem to go well for JC. She's eating more and her quality of sleep is okay, but not great. Two months later, she has her first sleepless night again. She started taking more and more vitamin B12 gummies, but then the bugs started crawling underneath her skin again, and she started hallucinating again. All of this while taking more and more of the vitamin gummies that the doctors had told her to take. She starts to believe that the vitamins weren't really her problem as she starts to develop delusions again. And finally, as she has another seizure, she's brought back to the emergency room again. At examination this time, doctors find macrocytosis again. They check her blood, and even though she's been eating more food than before and taking those gummies, her vitamin B12 levels were less than 10% the normal value. If she's eating more now than before and taking actual vitamin supplements, then why are her B12 levels so low? She's eating it, so that's not the problem, so maybe she's not absorbing it. It doesn't look like she has any problems with her stomach, so if her GI tract hasn't been damaged, then could there be something living inside of her GI tract that's consuming all of the vitamin B12? At this thought, doctors took a look in JC's stool. In it, they found eggs measuring 40 by 60 micrometers long. It wasn't just a couple of eggs, there were thousands. This was in addition to segments that probably broke off of what appeared to be a species of tapeworm. 
Doctors asked JC if she had recently eaten some grains. Sometimes grains can be contaminated with rodents and insects. Actually, it's almost impossible to have completely clean food, so there's a good chance you've eaten some objectionable matter contributed by insects, rodents, and birds. But some tapeworm parasites can live in infected insects, which can then make their way into contaminated grains. This could be what infected JC, but she was dieting. She actually didn't really eat carbs very often. And as doctors asked her this, she remembered the five-day-old gas station sushi that she ate more than nine months ago. The stomach cramps, the loose stools that followed them, the feeling of a fish flapping around in her belly. All of this pointing to a potential giant tapeworm that has been living and reproducing inside of JC that came from some contaminated fish of five-day-old gas station sushi. Doctors identify the tapeworm as Diphylobothrium latum, one of the largest tapeworms known to infect humans that can grow up to 30 feet long into the intestines. This species has a unique affinity for vitamin B12 and is well known to compete with the human host for the nutrient. Because JC had already been at risk of having low vitamin B12 because of her heavy caloric restriction, this only made the situation worse when the parasite started growing inside of her and prevent her from getting any vitamin B12. Because the tapeworm was in her small intestines, by the part where it joins to the stomach, it would suck out all of the vitamin B12 from the food that she ate so that when she received vitamin B12 injections, it looks like she started to get better, probably because the injection went right into the blood and not through the gut, where the parasite could extract B12 like it did in the gummy vitamins that she ate afterwards. As the B12 stores in her liver started to become depleted, and they were probably already low because of how she ate before the five-day-old sushi, her nerves started wasting away because the wrong chemicals were made in the cells without vitamin B12. Those wrong chemicals built up and slowly ripped apart her nerves. It started with insomnia, then she couldn't feel her hands and feet, then she saw bugs crawling on the walls before they started crawling underneath her skin, and before her psychosis, before her sensory ataxia, and before her seizures. Medicine was given to remove the parasite. Even if the tapeworm can lay over 1 million eggs per day and live 10 years in the human gut, all it takes is a single dose of parasitic medicine to cure JC. The medicine forces calcium into the worm, causing its muscles to cramp up, paralyzing it. With the tapeworm's defenses down, the immune system finally recognizes it and it attacks the worm as it slips out of her intestines and out of her body. And as JC started her full recovery, she was finally able to have a good night's sleep again. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself. Watch out for those gas station sushi leftovers and be well.